we'll get started. Um, go with this is uh, if you're in the right place, this is NMAP 101. Everyone in the right place? Good. Good. Um, I'd like to start uh, with just asking kind of who here has used NMAP before? Can I get a feeling for? Good. How many consider yourselves maybe expert level? Okay, probably that's, or you wouldn't be here, right? Okay. Um, my name is Chris Hopkins. I also go by Hydroplane. Um, the repo that we have, uh, if you want, don't want to write anything down, all my slides, the script that we're going to go through are on the URL. Um, a little bit about me. I grew up in Utah, joined the Army, went a few places. Um, I was a drill sergeant, so even if this mic gives out, I can keep, I can sure everyone can hear me. And I also was a, uh, uh, a combatives instructor, hand-to-hand -hand instructor in the Army. Um, the reason why I bring that up in this class is that I've learned in a lot of things that I've done that it's the fundamentals that is the, you know, yes, oh, there's, some, in, there's some interesting stuff, but usually success depends on how well you've managed your fundamentals. And NMAP or network scanning, the other, you know, other tools in this space, these are kind of fundamental tools. Kind of like if you don't, like basic training, if you can't shoot a rifle, you're just not a soldier. You, you know, that's kind of a paramount task that you have to be able to do. So network scanning, you know, when you're into InfoSec, again, it's a, a fundamental skill. And so we're gonna talk about, you know, what's considered one of the core t uh, tools in that space, which is NMAP. So. Uh, before we get into the tool too much, um, how many of you, uh, this is your first year at St. Con? Okay, good, good, like about half or more, good. Um, welcome, thank you. I've been involved in the community for about four years now. Um, it's been awesome, I've learned a lot, I've grown a lot. And so those of you who are new, you know, please get involved, please engage, there's a lot of different local groups that I have on this slide. For those of you who've been involved for a while, thank you, you've helped me grow. I appreciate that. So start with the end map. Here's a Wikipedia but, um, entry or description of it. But you know, it's basically you know, a network recon tool. Um, it came out, uh, FIDOR, um, which is you know, the handle uh, of the person who wrote the tool. Uh, he wrote it, I think it was a, um, an issue of 97 in uh, Frack Magazine, which was a hacker magazine, which I think is still running online, but they're kind of publishing in infrequently. But at first, was, his source code was out in the magazine, which meant it was a lot smaller than it is today. It can do a lot more now. Uh, as far as the what can it do, when I say host discovery, you can, you know, if you know an IP space, you can identify what, uh, you know, unless the machine's configured a certain way, you can find out what machines are where, find out what services or ports are open. Uh, it can also do uh, version detection by that. It basically grabs the banner from the service. When you make the request, it'll come back and have a banner and say some information about it. And you can find that out. So. It's not just is the service is running, but what, you know, more details about that service, which is useful. It has a way to fingerprint. Uh, when it's done scanning, it compare, you can configure it or so that it will check uh, the fingerprint it developed of the scan against its scans, and it will come back and make a pretty good guess of what operating system is running on that machine, which again is useful. Um, kind of the next level, the particularly interesting part of NMAP, at least for me, is the scripting engine. It was about 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, that they uh, went through and added scripting. And we're actually going to go through using some scripts and also show you kind of how to write one. So, legal concerns, when you port scan somebody, some not everybody likes getting port scanned. 
So the safe way to go, I would say, is, is scan your own stuff. And if you just can't get some equipment stood up, I would recommend going to, let me see if I can jump this up so you can read it. Uh, the the uh, Nmap actually hosts a machine called scanme.nmap.org. So if you want to scan against the machine, he specifically gives you permission to port scan this machine. So if you, if you don't have other options, you at least have that option. You know, I learn by doing, and so having something I can scan makes a difference. So how do you get Nmap? How many of you run uh, Kali Linux general, most of the time when you're doing this type of stuff? So a fair amount of you. Uh, but for you, it's already installed. For most Linux uh, distros, you're going to look at basically uh, just do app get or yum install for nmap and you'll, you can get installed. How many of you run uh, Mac? A lot of time. That's fairly popular. I like Homebrew for installing nmap. You know, it's easy to keep it updated, so I like Homebrew. And for the rest of you, I won't expect to ask you to raise your hand, but if you're running Windows, there are binaries you can download and install it. So, and of course, it is source code for those of you who have a lot of free time and to compile your stuff. Hey, there you are. Now, most of what we're going to go through is the command line examples of using Nmap. Uh, but there is a, a graphical user interface we're called Zenmap. Uh, one nice thing about Zenmap, especially when you're starting out, is I'm going to talk through a whole bunch of different thing, options you can do, but it's kind of hard to always remember that. But if you use Zenmap, as you're going through, let me, I have it up running here. I hope that's halfway readable. If it isn't, sorry. But what happens is you choose a different type of scan profile. It actually has different options. You'll you choose a different option. So as you're getting used to using Nmap, Zenmap might actually be pretty useful to you because it becomes a tool that kind of helps you learn to use it. So I would recommend that for that purpose. I like the command line because sometimes I'm on a uh, server, I don't have GUI and you know console, you always have that, right? So we talked about port scanning and Nmap is usually when someone asks you what it is, they'll say it's a port scanner. So then you kind of explain the, some ideas behind what a port is. Um, the best way I've thought, I've, analogy I've figured out is if you, th if you think of a machine or host as like a shopping mall, then you can almost think of a port as a store. Somewhere you, you can interact and do business. I know it's not specifically correct, but it gives you the idea that you need to have. Uh, there are a lot of ports that are kind of known ports, SSH22, HTTPs, port 80. Um, for those of you who do syslog, what port's that usually? Nobody? Okay. 514 is usually the one unless you can figure otherwise. So. But there's certain ports that are just no, uh, ex, you know, expected to be a certain port number uh, or certain services run on a certain port. One thing, if you're running a service between port uh, 1 and uh, 1024, uh, those are usually on like Linux machines. In order to run a service on those ports, you have to be run as root, which makes it kind of interesting if you're work, if you're looking at that. So how many ports are there? In the IP header, there's a space for the destination and uh, source port. It gives you two to 16, which basically means a little over 65,000 possible ports on a machine. Now by default, Nmap doesn't scan all 65,000 ports. There is a way you can configure it to hit all 65,000 ports. By, by default, it gets the top thousand most popular. 
And the benefit of that is you get your results a lot quicker than if you scan all the ports. Now, the bad part is, you know, sometimes in order to find out what's happening, you have to actually scan them all. And there's no substitution. Now, in Nmap, in the results, and we'll get looking at some examples, usually you're getting either open or closed. Open means you, you can enter, 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 there's something on that, running on that port that you can interact with. Closed mean, well, I mean, kind of opposite of that. You're also going to see sometimes filtered. Filtered is kind of Nmap for I'm not sure. So if you see that, it's not saying it's not definitively there's nothing talking, nothing listening. It means I'm not entirely, you know, my results are not conclusive. Now, you know, with the, these type of networks, we're looking at TCP or UDP. Now, TCP, you know, is, has a very, you know, sure or more sure way of establishing and making sure the data gets through. UDP is kind of your best effort. Uh, the reason why that's significant with running Nmap is because uh, with TCP, with the three-way handshake, which just in case you aren't familiar, basically is a connection is built. The initial say, you know, requester sends, hey, I want to talk. The other side says, you know, I want to talk. I acknowledge it. And then the other one, okay, let's talk. The, this uh, three-way handshake, uh, impacts the way sometimes you uh, you can do port scans. And some scans allow you to cheat and get results quicker, and so that's why this is significant. For Nmap, they, it kind of has an order of operation or steps that it usually performs. The, you know, like the first, you know, uh, counts goes through post discovery Reverse DNS, and if any of you run virtualized labs and then try to do port scanning, frequently you'll get a little error. It won't stop anything, but it'll complain that it can't do the reverse uh, DNS resolution. It'll actually do the port scanning, and it will do the banner grabbing, which we'll talk about in detail, the fingerprinting, trace route scripts, and then finally kick your out. But it doesn't perform all steps. But when it performs steps, it, these are the sequence in which it operates. You can turn that off. So some of the basic uh, options. Say you want to first, you don't want to port scan, but maybe you just want to find out what machines are in a given IP area, like maybe on your network. Now you start there and then maybe you'll choose to port scan specific machines. So SN basically says just basically do a ping sweep. It does actually more than ICMP actually tries 80 and 443 to see if the machine's there. Um, the next option I show here is PN. This one actually doesn't do discovery. And in a case that you want to do what is kind of like what they call a stealth scan, discovery kind of works against what you're trying to do because you're trying to be stealthy. So the PN option actually turns off discovery. And I'll show you an example for that a little bit later. P PR is interesting because um, it, for local scans, not over routed over the network, you can actually do ARP scans with P option PR. Again, not over the internet, but locally. So an example of the first one we went through. SN and then I choose an IP area. And it'll come back and it'll say, you basically, whenever it has results, it'll say, hey, I found these machines. And you know, I, they did dash 24, which meant I looked basically about a, C, a class C sized address space and gives you results fairly quickly. I mean, two seconds, right? So this is just host discovery example. Now, if you're not running as root and you're doing a scan and you want to uh, find machines and you're doing port scan, TCP it will do connect scan, which means it does all the, the, the whole three-way handshake to get the results. An example of that is like this. I scan one of my machines. It tells me I've got basically three services that it found. 
And notice the time on this, a little less than a second, right? Now they compare that with this next type of scan, which is called a SIN scan. With a SIN scan, it does the first two parts of the three-way handshake. It does the SIN and the SINAC. Once it's got the uh, SINAC, it knows that the service is responding. And it doesn't have to complete the handshake. The benefit or the, uh, the perceived benefit is you get results quicker when you're scanning ports. Now, the, the requirement is usually that you have to be a privileged user, root, to run that. An example here, the results don't look much different. And, and honestly, because it's just one machine, my time really didn't show much difference either. Now, these are TCP scans. The two ones I've gone through so far are just TCP. So if you look at the times, you got less than a, uh, less than a second result time. Now, not all services run TCP. Uh, some services run on UDP. And the only way to get those results is to run uh, with the SU function. Now, the thing about it is UDP is, takes longer. To do a UDP scan, uh, everything else being equal, it'll take a lot longer. So I recommend usually putting the v, fact, uh, v function. That will give you more details in your results, which if you're going to spend the time, get some value out of it, right? So an example of that, same machine, UDP scan. I get a bunch of services that I didn't find in the other scan, right? So SU, same machine, and I get different results. But notice how much time it takes for that. The other result, uh, queries were under a minute, under a second, and this was like about five sec or more than five minute, uh, minutes to get the results. So if you're going to UDP scan, it's worth doing, it has value, but I just acknowledge that the fact is going to cost you in time. Now there are some kind of special type of scans, um, Xmas or Christmas and null scans. And basically what happens is in the IP header, there are some options uh, for different flags. And the, these scan, uh, scans basically manipulate those options in a scan. And they're expecting a certain type of response. And it, the idea is if, they, if, these, if the machine you're scanning follows the rules, then uh, they should respond a certain way and you should find out if services are open. Now, the benefit, the perceived benefit of this is that some, on, especially a long time ago, these, machine, uh, these scans might not show up if you're if you're like detecting someone port scanning you these because they don't follow the rules and don't complete the the scan might be considered to be stealth you know me meaning that a, connect, a normal connection is not made and the machine not may not recognize that it's being port scanned that's why you would use these options now one thing about it is windows usually is kind of got a reputation for not always following the rules, the RFCs. So these Christmas or null scans will probably not give you the results you're looking for. And here's an example of a uh, Christmas scan. I have a null scan. But notice that you know it, it looks like it found the same ports open, but it uh, piped it with filtered, which meant because the way it scanned, the results aren't entirely reliable and then a null scan. A null scan is, uh, it comes through and it has, uh, this, you know, it gives you basically the same results. Again, the only reason why you'd want to run these besides being intellectually curious, which is more than enough reason to do anything, right? But, uh, is, you know, it's trying to be stealthy. I wouldn't count on that. To get real stealth, we have to go to what's called the idle scan. The idle scan, the way this one the works is that you would have, you know, the machine, you're, what they refer to as your target, the one you want to scan. And then you'd have another machine 
that you want it to be idle. That's why we call it the idle scan. What happens is this machine is going to be, uh, when, we, when we send requests to their target machine, we're going to say that we're the uh, idle machine. And so the scan will look, appear as if it's coming from the idle machine. So they'll be able to tell probably that they're getting port scanned, but the idea is they won't be able to determine that it's your machine that's doing the scan. The way it works is that it makes, first makes a request to the idle machine, gets a sequence ID, then makes a request to the remote machine, and that machine would respond back to the idle machine. And then you can make another request to the idle machine and check the sequence numbers. And based on that, you could come to a conclusion, uh, hey, maybe this port is open. A lot of newer operating systems um, are kind of wise to this type of trick, and you may find it difficult to execute. But it's kind of a fun one if you can pull it off. But that's your only real stealth scan. The idle scan, you know, the other ones, we, uh, we you know, historically we thought they were uh, stealth, but this one, because you're never sending your machine identifier or address to that remote machine, it does appear, you know, to be a stealth scan. Now, I mentioned this flag earlier when we went and talked about UDP. Uh, this, um, what happens is when you request, uh, when you do a port scan, in fact, let's do one. I'll clear out uh, here. And say nmap. And I do SV. And then say machine. Actually, do scan me. So it, it runs a scan. With the V field, uh, field, what you're going to see is an extra, besides just open and what it thinks the service is, it'll actually give you the banner uh, uh, so that the retrieved from the machine when it scanned it. So not only do you know that uh, what machi uh, you know, the machine's uh, there and that the service is running, but you might even know what version. And if you're familiar with older versions of SSH, then you might have ideas as to maybe what some type of vulnerabilities that machine might have. So that's the benefit of the V flag, is it gives you the banners, which you know, gives you more value for your port scan. And here's another example against another machine. Now, as I mentioned uh, earlier, OS detection, the way this works is that They've done a lot of scanning of machines in the past, and they've basically developed a, a library of fingerprints. In fact, let me get to that here. Let me fire up another. Well, let's stay in this one. In Kali, I'm not sure what will be on your other ones, but user share uh, nmap there will be like this OSDB. I won't, I won't throw it, but basically it's a list of fingerprints. So as it's done, it's scanning a machine, it'll come back and say, uh, I got this fingerprint from this machine, which one best matches? And then it makes guesses about what the operating system is that you're scanning. So that can be useful again an example of that. So it looks like a normal scan, but then at the bottom it looks at, hey, um, you know, looks like we, we guess that it's a Linux running an old kernel. Usually the scans, unless a lot of services are blocked, um, usually results are at least valuable. Maybe not 100% accurate, but at least have some value. Now, some of these scans, you can speed things up or slow things down. Uh, you basically, with the, with the T flag between one and five, you can either choose to go fast or slow. Now, the reason why you want to go fast is kind of obvious. Uh, for slow, the idea is maybe if you slow down the, the report, your report scanning, 
the other machine won't see the flood of traffic or the network intrusion detection system won't see it and won't detect that its you know, port scan is going on. The thing I'd warn about that is if you do with a, say, a really slow one, it, it takes a long time to get results. So, you know, this is try, try to be sneaky, but I would say that, you know, there's a price to pay in time again if you take it slow. Now, you can also configure timeouts. Uh, sometimes with some, especially like, say, UDP, um, you're not you, there's only so long you want to wait for a response before moving on because you, you don't have forever to wait for a response. So you can configure, hey, how long should I wait? Again, you know, if you're coping with latency issues, this is a, a valuable flag in this case. Now, a lot of the results, as you've seen so far, are just to the screen, right? But Nmap, one nice thing is if you run an Nmap scan and you do it to, out, uh, say, XML output, other tools can import the, your results. So those of you who have ever used Metasploit, uh, what you can do is you can do an Nmap scan outside of Metasploit, output it to XML, and then inside Metasploit, import the scan results. So there's a benefit in that. Uh, the different options are normal, which is basically what you see on the screen. XML, no one wants to look at that, right? S for script kitty, which is kind of elite, elite speak. I don't know what the practical value of that is, but it's an option. Uh, G for greppable. And basically, if you've ever used grep to look through results, Sometimes you would want the, the host name and the service to be on the same line as you're grepping through it. So it formats it so that grep is more useful. And then A, and it does mall. So, yeah. Now, the part that I kind of, that, what we've gone through so far is really what was probably about NMAP be, be at and before 2006. You know, which was still a very useful tool. But in uh, 2006, Google threw some money at them and they added scripting to it. And the nice thing is you can add, you can kind of extend the functionality of Nmap. Let's say you have a specific problem and you want to be able to uh, add some functionality into your scans to give you certain results. The Nmap scripting engine can do that. It can do a lot actually. By default, if you, if you aren't interested in writing your own scripts, which I understand, you can, uh, there are over 500 scripts that currently exist. In fact, let's go there. So if we go in the scripts directory, I uh, do ls. There we go. 580, I, re I updated my uh, Nmap this morning. So right now, even without writing any scripts, there are over you know, that many uh, um, available scripts. Now, if you're interested, in your, like usually what they do is if you look at them, they're usually by service, then you know, like looking for CVEs or something. So say you're interested in SSH, you can do you know, LS SSH star, and it'll come through. So chances are before you would write your own script, I'd recommend looking in, a, in the directory and see what scripts already exist. I mean, if it's a common enough problem, chances are someone's already written a script for that. Now going back. And you know, here's an example. Say you want to ch see what you, how your, your configuration for SSL, you can have it list the uh, ciphers that's config the machine is configured to support. Now the, the dash P option, which I think I may have shown earlier, but the dash negative P, the benefit of using that sometimes, if you know that you're interested in SSL, by specifying which port you want, means it doesn't do the full port scan, it focuses on the service you want, which basically means you get results quicker because it's not going to spend a lot of energy doing the port scan when you're specifically interested 
in a specific service. And here's an example. I've scanned a machine. It comes back and says, you know, uh, T you know TLS 1.2 uh, configurations. And it actually gives a letter grade. Um, there, you know, I've, I've given another presentation in the past on uh, TLS configuration. And the benefit, you know, sometimes I like SSL labs, and it's good scan, but maybe you don't want someone, you know, a machine outside your network scanning you. So you can actually run, with Nmap, you can scan your own services and get results. Now with uh, scripts, there are a number of different categories. And script will usually belong to more than one. Uh, the, the default, if you uh, run scripts and you don't specify otherwise, they'll run the safe and the default, which are not, you know, services, the uh, type of scans or scripts are not meant to potentially cause any problems. There are some scripts that actually can brute force, for example. Let's look at that. At Telnet star. Let's see, no, LS, uh, LS Telnet star. Okay. So there is a Telnet brute force script here. And it will do what you kind of think it will do. You, you can point at it and it will basically try to brute force the password of a Telnet service. Uh, and so obviously that would not be considered a normal safe type of, uh, you know, scan to run. But, you know, they have different options. Kind of be aware of that. Uh, how many of you have ever written in Lua before? I know some people have done Minecraft. Uh, what is it? A World of Warcraft? Or I think you also use it in uh, Wireshark. Anyways, they've chosen Lua as the as uh, scripting language to use for writing uh, NMAP scripts. Now, uh, they, you know, some of the benefits of that is they didn't want to have to worry about really low-level things, but they wanted a lot of decent functionality. So that's how we end up with Lua. Now, with NMAP, a script, if you're writing one or if you're looking at one, they're going to have three main sections. There's going to be a header, which has mostly metadata information. And it's also going to have a rule. And basically, the, in the rule part of, a, of the script is something that has to evaluate to true. And if it evaluates to true, then it performs the last section of the script, which is the action, the particular logical part of your script. So... When you're writing your own, I recommend using the dash D because it'll output to your screen. will show you more details. If it's not working the way you expect it to, dash D is your friend. And there are a lot of libraries. If you go up one level, NSE lib is basically where they've got all the libraries currently available. The nice thing about these libraries is you can include them like you've done in maybe some other programming or scripting languages, and you can leverage a lot of functionality. So you don't have to write all, you know, you, if you're creating a solution, you don't have to start from scratch. You can say, hey, I got this functionality, I'll use it in my script. So here's probably the the shortest script I could write, uh, not very useful, but it gives you an example. So everything from, let's see here. From, okay, let's go back there. Everything uh, from description to categories is part of the header. And again, it's kind of a description, uh, an example output, some information about the script. Then the, uh, the port rule or the rule is basically saying, hey, I, I'm looking, I want to, if the port state equals open. Then my action, which is again, not that interesting, will just say it'll, it'll output open to the user. Again, you know, I don't really need to write a script to do this. Nmap pretty much does this by default. Now, and so I've got a little bit more practical example and uh, if you have questions, I'm sorry, I've been kind of going quickly. But if you do have questions, I'll, I'll answer them if you raise your hand. 
Uh, my, my problem, the reason why I wrote this script is I have uh, a lot of websites at my company. And I wanted to check like over a thousand plus. And I wanted to uh, check uh, the extra, if, if any of my certificates have expired on any of my websites, TLS certificates. So, you know, when you get to that scale, running, you know, to a scanner, you know, isn't as practical. So I wrote an NSE script, and I'm going to show you, it's simple enough to solve that problem for myself. So let's go there. So the script is SSL expiration. Let me scroll up here. So early on, this is where I use a lot of those libraries at the very top here. I require them, and now I have, uh, I have all that functionality I can leverage. Then my normal metadata example of what the results would be, and you know details about that. Then my port rule, which basically use, uh, says, if there's SSL supported on this port, then, you know, then I want the action to be performed. Now, I've added another function in here, but that function's at the very bottom here. But this function is basically to format the uh, output of the date from the, uh, from the certificate so I can get something a little bit more human readable, easier to use. And again, my last part is to run, uh, is to connect to a port, get the certificate, then uh, uh, get the uh, expiration date, and output that. And if I don't get a certificate, I say I didn't get the certificate. But the benefit of this, let me clear this, is if I run this scan, say I have a text file of my machines I want to scan. And it could be a lot bigger than this. We'll just have three for now. But if I do nmap 443, because I'm, I'm looking at my SSL script, and then I do SSL expiration. And then another option I didn't show you earlier, you can choose your input by doing I and then capital L from a list, then your file that's the list you want. And when this runs, I get my results pretty quick. And it'll tell me when my certificates expired, which actually one of them already did. One will expire today and one will tomorrow. So I did that intentionally so I could see the results. But if I had a thousand sites, I mean, it would be obviously take more time, but I could still get a fairly quick uh, scan of all my machines. So this is the reason why I wrote this script. Any questions about this script or the idea be behind writing NMAP scripts? All right. So I hope this is an introduction. I know I kind of threw a lot at you. But I hope that you kind of have an understanding of kind of what it can do for you, what you can use it for. Um, if you want to know more, uh, here's where you want to find out. The nmap.org website, in fact, let's go to there, has a lot of documentation that you can go through. There's a big book, which I think I've included in nmap network scanning, but you don't need to buy the book. Chances are, you can go to the website and get most of the content from that book. But it's a good book. It's a big, thick one. When I first got into Nmap, the book I used to learn about how to use it was Nmap Essentials. It's a packet pub book. If you have the Safari books online, you should have access to that. I liked it. It was a good one. A lot of Nmap, you have a lot of different flags and options. And while, you know, early on, you might find it useful. SANS has a cheat sheet with different options you can use uh, no, of value. And we're a little ahead of schedule, but that's okay. Uh, question, do you have, uh, what questions do you have? Any things I may have not covered or things that you're interested in? Yeah. Yes. Good, uh, good question. Let's go back to that. 
And my slide deck is available and the script is available at that URL. The GitHub, uh, hopefully you can read that. Yeah, it also will be on the SyncCon. I submitted it to the, so when they have the collection of everyone's slides, it, it should be there too. What's that? They're streaming, okay. Okay, stri uh, streaming, and it also my uh, presentation will be on YouTube, so there there's another where, place you can get that. Other questions? Okay. Well, then uh, you know, kind of the they the Nmap likes to show when Nmap's being used in a movie. How many of you have ever seen Nmap used in a movie? What movie? Yeah, NCIS, yeah. The two people using the same keyboard show, yeah. Sorry about that. Whenever I see that, it's cringe. Um, what other movies, anyone? Or TV shows? I miss, uh, iRobot? I haven't seen that one. I'm pretty sure you find it in Mr. Robot. Um, Mr. Robot, yeah. Um, one that was kind of, or at least the uh, first time I ever saw in a movie something that actually looked halfway legitimate was uh, Trinity and Matrix uh, Reloaded. She, uh, she uses an NMAP to scan a machine, uh, the power grid, finds out they're running uh, SSH, then runs SSH nuke and gets in and takes down the power grid, which I thought was really kind of cool. So anyways, but uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.